If you started Tyler Chatwood on Thursday night, he either gave you negative 15 fantasy points using the CBS scoring or a 30.86 ERA and a 4.71 whip over two and a third innings pitch. Frank Stanfield here with Scott White. Welcome to Fantasy Baseball today on August 7th. I would say happy Friday, Scott, but I started Chatwood on five of my teams. And honestly, I just want to spite drop him for the first name that I see. I hope that you're doing better than I am, Scott. Uh, yeah, no, I think you probably beat me to Chatwood in those five leagues. So happy uh, I did. The, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure I got him anywhere. What? Not for lack of trying. He was probably, he, he's probably been the biggest starting pitcher pickup off the waiver wire so far this year, right? We were talking about it before the show. I mean, Ross Stripling got added very early on. Uh, Nate Pearson when it was clear he was coming up, Zach Plesak had a big jump, but I think, you know, starting, starting ownership percentage to current, that is probably the biggest jump is it belongs to Chatwood. Yeah. I easily could have saved him for the, Oh my goodness, gracious player of the night. And not for good reason, obviously, but he doesn't even deserve it. I mean, this was bad, Scott, two and a third, 11 hits, eight earned runs, zero walks, four strikeouts. I tweeted earlier, well, Tyler Chatwood was fun. <laughs> Someone responded, uh, well, at least he didn't walk anyone. <laughs> like, that was the biggest takeaway. At least he didn't walk anyone. Uh, you mentioned that he is going to be, uh, that he was one of the most added starting pitchers so far this season. Will he be one of the most dropped by tomorrow? And should he be, Scott? He might be, just because fantasy players are a reactive bunch. I I don't think he should be. If, I if if he's dropped in any of my leagues, I'll still find a way to to add him. Like it's obviously not an open and shut case whether Tyler Chatwood is good, but his first two starts were awesome, especially that second one against the Pirates, 20 swinging strikes. Uh and you know, really strong down the stretch last year. And and whoever it was who tweeted you, they they do have a point. I mean, the problem for Chatwood at the start of his Cubs career was way too many walks and that seems like an issue he's whipped but it didn't stop him from getting knocked around in this start everybody's entitled to a bad start more than one bad start really over the course of the season so you know if if chatwood was the pitcher who inspired the most uh enthusiasm uh, among waiver wire options to this point in the season then i i think it's premature to drop him you know, another start like this, I think we're definitely at that point. But uh, for now, I'm going to chalk this up as a fluke. And you know, I might be reluctant to start him next week. Let me see if I can find who he's pitching against real quick. Well, but uh, I wouldn't want to necessarily serve him up to somebody else if it was just a fluke. And that's what's so rough about this, Scott, is that on paper, it was a pretty good matchup. I mean, going up against... The Kansas City Royals in Kansas City. It's not a bad park to pitch in. Next week, he is scheduled to be in Cleveland against Mm -hmm. the Indians, which is kind of a run-of-the-mill start. I would say in most 12-team leagues, I'm probably not going to have Chatwood in the lineup. I've got to see what he does as a bounce back after this before I get him back in there. Sure. Speaking of being reactionary, Scott, I'm going to get us started here. Oh, my goodness gracious. Dylan Bundy. The way that people are talking about this guy on Twitter, you would think he's the greatest pitcher of all time. I mean, he was pretty damn good. Third career complete game on Thursday. He allowed one run on four hits with 10 strikeouts, 16 swinging strikes on 107 pitches. Once again, continued to use his fastball less. So less is good when it comes to the fastball because he averaged less than 90 miles per hour on his fastball today and that continues to drop. But... He opted for more changeups today, which I thought was interesting. He didn't go as slider heavy, and the changeup was pretty good. He had four whiffs on the change today. The slider looked great once again. The, the past two starts have been against the Mariners, so you know you, you got to keep that in mind. It's obviously a very good start, but I've moved him all the way up to my SP thirty one. Scott, am I crazy? No, I have him. Well, I adjusted it before this start, and I moved him up to. 41. Uh, yeah, I could move him up a few more spots. Probably, I'd put him behind Stripling, who I have 35th. Matthew Boyd's in that same area. I'd probably go right around there, mid 30s for Bundy. Uh, I think that makes sense. I, I he was, 
I, I had him as a sleeper pick. I, I know I wasn't alone. It was it was really the change of scenery argument for a guy who never uh, put it all together in Baltimore. There was a time Dylan Bundy was the top pitching prospect in all of baseball. And that breaking ball of his, the uh, – what is it technically classified as? It's like – I don't know. It's a weird pitch. It's kind of a hybrid pitch. I think usually slider is is how yeah. they classify it. Yep. Um, but yeah, that's that's always been so good. And it was just small park in Baltimore, bad division, team with a poor track record with developing pitchers. He goes to this big ballpark, a good division for pitchers, and obviously a new set of eyes working with them and seems to have changed his pitch mix a little. And like he's dominating so far. So it's it's totally backed up the narrative to this point. I don't know how you can't feel encouraged by that. As you say with the matchups and of course, just the fact of three starts, not an open and shut case yet, but like you could say that for all, all but like 20 starting pitchers in baseball. Right. So um, yeah, I don't think it's ridiculous to move them up to around 30, 35 rest of season. Yeah. I think it's a really good point that you bring up too, because I was redoing my rankings today. I was shuffling these things around. And it's really like once you get past Stripling, Savale, Denelson, Lamette, that's like my 35, 36, 37 in starting pitcher ranks right now. Mm-hmm. James Paxton right after him, Matthew Boyd, Madison Baumgartner. I mean, you don't feel great about those names. So it's, you know, it's really the top, yeah. ter- the top 30, the top 35. And that's really what you were preaching, you know, all season, all preseason long, Scott, that you wanted, you know, four or five of your top 30 starting pitchers. Now, some of those names have shuffled around a little bit, but, you know, that's, uh, that's basically where we, where we're at now. We've basically yeah. come full circle. Uh, one last note on Dylan Bundy. Alex Fast, who does great work with Pitcher List, tweeted this out today. His 41.1 CSW, which is called strikes plus whiff rate, leads all of baseball. So, again, it's just a, a great transformation for Dylan Bundy. Is there anything else you wanted to add there, Scott? Sounded like you no, wanted to get a word. Looking at the way starting pitcher is breaking down right now, I, I may have undersold it a little saying 20 uh, pitchers that are open and shut cases. Because it's, it's really right around where I have Bundy, as I think you were pointing out, you get to that 30 to 35 range. So I go, you know, 28, I have Ryu, 29, Maeda, 30, Wheeler. We feel confident with those guys, right? 31, Max Freed. Feel really oh, good about him. Denison love him. Lamette, Kyle Hendricks. And then, so I have Kyle Hendricks, 33rd. And then you get into Matthew Boyd, eh, Ross Stripling, feeling pretty good, but, you know, not totally sure where that's going to go. Julio Urias. And, yeah, that, that seems like the right spot to slot Dylan Bundy. Yeah, so we're in agreement there, Scott. Who was your, oh, my goodness, gracious player of the night? A standout, whether it's positive or negative from Thursday. Oh, it's positive. I think the most added player from today should be Tuki Toussaint. Tuki Toussaint, a guy who was a pretty exciting pitching prospect at one point. The Braves had a slew of them. Uh, to this point, the only two who have broken through are Mike Soroka and Max Freed. But, you know, they're, they're overdue for having more breakouts among that crew. And Tuki Toussaint showed pr- some pretty clear signs of, of that tonight against the Blue Jays. He went six and two-thirds innings, four hits, three earned runs allowed, no walks and nine strikeouts. Those last two are you know, especially noteworthy. And, and really through six innings, uh, he was just insane through six innings. I think he had only given up two hits, uh, one run. He, he had thrown 66 pitches and gotten nine strikeouts through six innings. So he was just like pounding the zone. And like, if he's going to be that aggressive with hitters, that stuff is going to play because that, that stuff is pretty ridiculous, especially the curveball. He, he got some traction as a minor leaguer for having this jiff, jaw-dropping, jiff-worthy curveball. And to this point as a major leaguer, it's like, okay, yeah, it looks pretty, but how effective is it going, is it going to be? His, his splitter had actually been his most effective pitch. The curveball was really working in this game, though. Of, of his 15 swinging strikes, seven came on the curve. Five came on the splitter. I mean, it looks like a good pitch itself. He has a great arsenal, and he just needs to have confidence in it. And like this, might this may have been a breakthrough for him. Obviously, you know, he could go out next start and walk three batters in three and two thirds innings, and just never, never have a start like this 
again, but you know, you, you take, you, you have to, you have to seize the moment when it presents itself and just hope it's the start of something. And I think we're, I think that's what you need to do with Tuki Toussaint. The biggest takeaway, and you hit on it, Scott, was the nine strikeouts to zero walks because he is someone who has struggled mightily with command in his career and has really struggled with walks. So to see that ratio there, the 15 swinging strikes, he's also ditched his two-seamer so far this season. He's using a four-seam, a splitter, a curve, and a slider. So it could be addition by subtraction there. Something Chris has spoke about before is, you know, if you don't have a great two-seamer, you really just shouldn't throw it because it's just not really a productive pitch across baseball. And it seems like so far that is what Tuki Toussaint has done this season. He is 13% rostered in CBSSports.com leagues, and he has SPARP eligibility too. So if you play in a mm-hmm. points league, he has RP eligibility as of now. Uh, he actually doesn't have starting pitcher eligibility yet. So something to also keep in mind, Scott, I just got to ask the question. Would you drop Tyler Chatwood for Tuki Toussaint? I would not do that. Uh, but to help contextualize this, like I'd, I'd rather have, I'd rather have Tuki Toussaint than Chris Bubich, who's somebody we've talked about a lot recently. I'd rather have him than... I can see it. The prospect pedigree is there for Tuki. I, I like Bubich quite a bit, though, too. Yeah. Um, that one's close. You know, I want to drop, like, Plesak for him. I wouldn't drop... Kiku- like, he's, he's probably about on the same rung as Kikuchi for me. I'd rather have Kikuchi. I agree. Uh, but that, like Tuki Toussaint would probably be right behind that in, in terms of priority. And, and Kikuchi's still widely available too. He's only like 32, 35% rostered or something like that. So, you know, if it comes down to that choice, that's where I am with Toussaint. But ideally, I'd like to make a spot for him. Tuki's next start is scheduled to come against the Yankees in Yankee Stadium next week. So uh, I don't think, even if you add him, I don't think you're going to get him out there for that. But uh, definitely worth a speculative ad to see if this is for real, someone who has that type of prospect pedigree. Some news and notes from Thursday. George Springer exited the game against the Diamondbacks with a right wrist strain. Uh, His x-rays are negative, according to Dusty Baker. So that's good news. Let's see. It wouldn't surprise me if he gets a day off here uh, and then returns back over the weekend. But let's see what happens with George Springer. Uh, Referring to Jordan Alvarez and Jose Arquiti, Dusty Baker said, quote, the cavalry is a way off. (laughs) Scott, what does that mean? (laughs) Yeah, it, it... Like from what I could tell, Jordan Alvarez just showed up at the minor league camp today and was taking batting practice and running for the first time. I don't know how that could be. <laughs> I feel like we were led to believe otherwise. It yeah, wasn't it clear uh, for yeah. baseball activities like a week ago. <laughs> that would, yeah, I, it, I thought so. That would that would suggest he's a ways off though, as uh, Dusty Baker says. So um, I would not count on activating him this upcoming week four. Hopefully, week five. Hopefully, hopefully, I have a lot of shares of them. <laughs> I, I, I feel, I feel really good. Like most of the leagues, I, I have Jordan Alvarez. I'm doing great. So, I, thankfully, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how long I can keep it together without him, though. And that is a great feeling too. When you were just stashing yeah. a stud away, and you get off to a nice yeah. little start, that is, uh, I would say, along with when you're in a draft and you're considering drafting a player. And then they make it all the way back to you at the next turn. I would say that's oh, yeah. probably the best feeling in fantasy. But that is a great feeling. That is, a, uh, you know, your little situation with Alvarez is definitely a great one as well. Jack Flaherty will not start on Friday for the Cardinals against the Cubs. If you were expecting that, he will pitch either Sunday or Monday. So if you have him in your lineup for over the weekend, I don't know if you have the ability to take him out, but you probably won't know until the day of. So pay attention to that for Jack Flaherty. Jose Quintana. Through another bullpen session on Thursday, he'll uh, throw another one Saturday. And if that goes well, he will join the rotation next week. Scott, who will get the boot from the Cubs rotation? I I don't know that we know for sure, but given the clunker that Chatwood just put up and the fact that Alec Mills has pitched really well, I don't really know what the Cubs' plan is here. I would suspect it's Alec Mills. Ah. Chatwood, Chatwood secured that spot very early on back in spring training. And Alec Mills, I mean, come on, we're 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 a little we're pretty skeptical of what he's done at this <laughs> point, right? Yeah i I think it would be I think it would be Mills, but you know, somehow hopefully. Chris has just dubbed me the Alec Mills guy, so I'm I'm just trying to embrace it. He throws a 67 <laughs> mile per hour fa- uh, curveball, so that's cool. If he threw a 67 mile per hour fastball, he probably wouldn't be in baseball, which is what I was about to say. Uh, but. Huh. 
something to monitor for the Cubs as well. Yanni Chirinos went to the IL with triceps inflammation. Trevor Richards was recalled, and I assume will be a follower of some sort or some type of long reliever. Maybe he gets a chance to start, see what happens. Uh, Joe Adele was not in the lineup Thursday due to, quote, a little tightness in his quad. You hate to see it. First, we get Nick Madrigal called up. He gets hurt. Joe Adele gets called up. Now he has tightness. Hopefully he's all right because I have a feeling a lot of people just spent fab, big fab on Joe Adele. Fat fab. Fat fab for Joe Adele. Uh, Some standouts from Friday, uh, Thursday. Skipping ahead here, Scott. You're listening to this on Friday, but we're going to recap Thursday. Uh, Some studs, some pitchers. Carlos Carrasco against the Cincinnati Reds. Six innings, one hit, zero earned runs, four walks, eight strikeouts, 16 swinging strikes on 97 pitches. He has quality starts in all three of the starts he has made, 23 strikeouts to just six walks at this point. Scott, we were talking about you know starting pitcher ranks early on, and look, Carlos Carrasco is just like firmly inside my top 30, and I think you can argue he might even have to move up after a start like this. Carlos Carrasco has gone six innings in all three of his starts so far. If you'd asked me the chances of that coming into the season, particularly you know, after the shutdown, the, the hurried ramp up, uh, I, I would have given it virtually no chance that he would go six innings in all three of his first three starts. So, I mean, he's like, there, there are no worries with Carlos Carrasco at this point. He's just the stud he's been for the past several years. Which is just so crazy because, I mean, we had so many question marks coming in. And last year, he obviously had the diagnosis with leukemia. And he's just, it looks like he is the Carlos Carrasco of old. So you drafted him in the middle rounds. You know, you might get, when it's all said and done, top 20 SP value in return for Carlos Carrasco. Someone who also has SPARP eligibility. On the other side in that game, Scott, Luis Castillo, not so hot. Five innings pitched, four hits, three earned, four walks. This was the first game of the season where he really struggled with the walks. Nine strikeouts, 16 swinging strikes. His swinging strikes are always going to be there. That's not the issue. His velo is actually (laughs) up this year, 97 miles per hour on average with his fastball. Uh, He was basically just destroyed by Jose Ramirez, and Jose Ramirez had a monster game today, Uh, but he has now allowed eight earned runs over his last two starts. Uh, Let's fire up the worryometer here, Scott, on Luis Castillo. Where where do we stand? Um, Two... Too. It's frustrating. I get that it's frustrating. Especially because the, the last start was against the Tigers, too, you know, Scott? Yeah. The yeah. talent was so evident. Uh, you know, he hasn't gotten destroyed yet. He hasn't had a Chadwood start. But the last two starts, you know, the first start was amazing. The last two starts, eh, you, you you want more from it. I'll point out that one of those starts, he had 22 swinging strikes. He had 16 in this one. You know, it's a start where he allowed four hits and recorded nine strikeouts, to put it in perspective. and. I get, I get why you'd be frustrated, but like, don't. This, this is not the sort of thing you need to worry about. If you don't have Castillo, put in buy low offers for him because he is, like, he, he's going to come around. It's just the stuff is too good. Uh, Kenta Maeda was pretty good. Another one that just got doomed by the long ball. Just, you know, he allowed three hits over six innings, three earned runs. Uh, one of those hits was a three run homer from Gregory Polanco. One walk, four strikeouts, 12 swinging strikes on 80 pitches for Maeda. I think the bigger story in this game, Scott, was the fact that Taylor Rogers wound up blowing the win and the save for Kenta Maeda in this one. Came in, in the in the ninth, uh, his final line. He only recorded one out, three hits, two earned allowed for Taylor Rogers. Uh, I I would imagine that there's a decent leash for Taylor Rogers, and he's been yeah. good to this point, so I'm I'm not really yeah. worried. Nor am I. Everybody blows safe sometimes. This is not this does not really register on my worryometer. You know, beyond beyond that everybody's closer label seems to be uh hanging by a thread this year especially. But no, I, I don't think there's really anything to worry about here. I do want to point out with Maeda, though, he's been right around 80 to 85 pitches in all three of the starts, six innings each time. Uh, so, you know, on the surface, it looks pretty good. I'm just, I'm, I, it, it still leads me to wonder if they're going to push him harder than the Dodgers did, which was the whole rationale behind him being this big breakout. Because so far, 
maybe you know maybe it's just been so he's been so efficient they haven't needed to he's gone six innings every time like i said but i'd like to see him have some 100 pitch outings here to really feel good about that pick so i'm looking at third time through the order in his career it's Look, it's not it's, it's not good, but it's not terrible. I, like a four seven hey. nine ERA. A, a lot of pitchers we talk about third time through the order are a lot worse than that. So basically, every pitcher is bad the third time through right. the order. It's just degree to which you're bad, and you know a l- lot of pitchers get destroyed third time yeah. through. The, I, I I wonder if well I don't know. Toussaint, like I said, Toussaint today was untouchable through those six innings, and then ended up giving two run to uh, giving up two runs when he came out in the seventh two hits um you know one of them was not a very well struck ball so I, I don't know that it's even fair to put it there but you know it's an example of a guy coming out for the third time through the order and it kind of messing up his his stat line for the day that, that happens a lot it, it it happens historically it doesn't happen that much with Maeda like not to the degree it happens with most pitchers like he should be somebody who should handle the third time through the order. Yeah, it's just, it's weird that uh, you're right that the the Twins haven't really pushed him so far. I mean, maybe the Dodgers were onto something, but based on his numbers third time through, I mean, it it doesn't seem like there's anything too evident there with Maeda. So uh, let's, yeah. uh, that's something that we'll continue to track here uh, regarding him. Zach Gallen, tough matchup again. Second, second tough matchup in a row. Last time out against the Dodgers, this time out against the Astros. Six innings, six hits, two earned, one walk, six strikeouts. Nine swinging strikes on 92 pitches. Mind you, the Astros are a team that does not swing and miss all that much. He now has 15 strikeouts, just two walks over his last two. Both of those were quality starts against the Astros and the Dodgers. Um, If you had any concern after his first start where he walked five guys, I mean, you should not anymore. The problem, Scott, is that his next start comes in Colorado. Are you going to start Zach Allen in that matchup? Uh, probably. Mm. Yeah, he's he's of the caliber. I'd have to have some really good alternatives to think about sitting him. I it makes me nervous, but usually I start studs at Colorado, and I think he's, I think he's in the stud category for me. Would you? I probably will. Is right. I, I think you said it the right way. We both have him ranked inside of our top twenty-five starting pitchers now. So, I, yeah, it's just, like, hard to get away from a guy that's ranked that highly, right? Like, the name that I was going to bring up was his counterpart today, Brandon Bialik, who five innings, zero earned, three walks, one strikeout. So, I mean, not overpowering. He wasn't great. Ten swinging strikes on 82 pitches. He uses five different pitches. So, he has my attention. His next start, I believe, is against the Giants, which is a very good matchup. Yes, it's against the Giants. So, like, you're not going to go as far as, as to start someone like Bialik just because he has a great matchup no. over someone like Gallon, who's in Colorado, right? Right. Well, that's the thing. Like, you, there, there's nobody probably on the waiver wire that you'd pick up to start in place of Zach Gallon at Colorado. So that's why how many people have uh, good enough bench options at starting pitcher that they could justify it. And maybe... Some in like 10 team leagues, but probably not that many. Yeah, I, I would agree. You know what? Let, let's, I was going to save it for later. Let's look at some of the two star pitchers for next week while we're talking about matchups for next week and see if we can find anyone that we potentially would use over someone like Zach Gallon, who has a tough matchup. So, uh, Scott, I know that you are either in the process or you have already written the pitching planner for week four for next week that starts on Monday, August 10th. Who are some two-star pitchers that stand out to you at the top of the list there? Well, I think this is probably the third week we've in a row we've talked about Adrian Hauser being a two-star pitcher. So <laughs> one of these yeah, weeks he'll get it. <laughs> one of these weeks he will actually make two starts. Uh, and I, I imagine people are feeling pretty good about him now after the start he just had. He's almost, he's creeping up toward 80%, uh, being rostered in 80% of leagues. So not really picking up him. I, how do, how do you feel about starting Lance McCullers with matchups against the Giants and the Mariners? Obviously, he was terrible last time out. It was the worst start of his career, you could argue. Um, but it, you know, he talked about it, it wasn't control issues. He said he, 
he didn't feel he said he felt good about the way he was throwing the ball, even though the results weren't good. And then he has these two great matchups coming up. It's it's really tempting. I I have him in the startable range here in my two start pitcher rankings uh, across all formats. I, I think I think you have to do it with those two matchups. I mean, I, it's a slam dunk, Scott. It, it, I understand okay. he is he's been he's struggled the past two starts, but if you're not going to start someone at home for two against San Francisco and Seattle, that pitcher is probably not worth owning. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, like the matchups are, you know, outside of like the Tigers and yeah, I would put the Marlins on this list, but all of a sudden the Marlins are juggernauts or maybe that's just because they're facing the Orioles pitching staff. But maybe uh, these are, you know, two of the five best pitching matchups in baseball right now, the Giants and the Mariners. So uh, if I own McCullers, uh, I would start McCullers over Gallon. Like if I was deciding between those two, that is that is a move I would make, yeah. I don't know if I agree with you there, but that's fine. That's fine. Um, the first of the two start options, or the highest I have ranked here, he's widely available, uh, that, that you might be able to pick up is Randy Dobnak, who we talked about yesterday. Yeah. One of his two matchups is against the Royals, and it just seems like a, a low-risk profile. Not, not a high upside profile, but low-risk. A lot of ground balls, good control. ERA's been good at every turn. Minors and majors last year, obviously, only one earned run allowed across three starts this year. I think it's I think it's time to give Randy Dobnak a, a shot in fantasy. I was gonna, does. I was gonna make a proposition to, to Chris last night, Scott. Let me know what you think about this. Because he was kind of he was talking down our guy Randy Dobnak. Me and you were kind of on the same page. I was going to say, if Randy Dobnak either puts up two quality starts or wins both of his starts next week, Chris has to shave his face like Randy Dobnak. <laughs> do you think he would agree to it? Well, what would you have to do if he doesn't? Because that's asking a lot. Then I'll shave my face like him. Two quality starts. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, think, <laughs> I kind of I think you're taking the worst odds there. That That's a pretty high standard to set. Of course, it's possible yeah. Dobnak could clear it. Yeah, no, I mean, my the odds are definitely in Chris's favor. I mean, yeah. to win both or get two quality starts, we yeah. might have to alter it a little bit, but <laughs> I, I want someone on this podcast to grow a, a, a Dobnak, a Dobnak yeah. mustache. I just, I don't know who it's going to be. I don't think it's going right. to be you, Scott. Sorry. Oh, it, it, it would take a while and it <laughs> would, it would not look authentic. I can tell you that. Uh, Tyler Molly. Mally, sorry, Tyler Mally. It looks like Molly, but it's Mally. He uh, he's going against Kansas City and Pittsburgh this week, so I'm not high on him overall. But two matchups like that, I think you definitely have to call him a sleeper. Uh, that's probably it among those who would be widely available. Dustin May is making is in line for two starts this week. Still don't know when Alex Wood is coming back. But he's probably okay. I'd I'd run Blake Snell out there with two starts at Boston at Toronto. Uh, not confident he'll go in long enough in either start to get you a win, but he could get you seven innings combined with a high strikeout total. I think it's worth it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I like I like the Dobnak call. I like Mally. I mean, two really good matchups there. They're both at home, so a little more scary pitching in, in Great American Ballpark there. Uh, but mm. those are those are two that that I do like. Looking at some other names on this list, Garrett Richards at the Dodgers at Arizona. I mean, what yeah, do you I'm do? I'm recommending with that? it. Yeah? I'm recommending it. Okay. Actually, I think Arizona is a good matchup. Dodgers obviously isn't, but Arizona has not mustered much offensively so far this year. And you know, other than Cattel Marte, it's not like they have a bunch of stars there. I think it's an okay matchup. Kyle Gibson, uh, we spoke about last yeah. night. One, one yeah. really good, one really bad. This is, this is where you kind of get dicey with these two star pitchers because you like the mm. Seattle matchup, but in Colorado, it's mm. one of those where I could see him getting a quality start. I could see him not getting out of the second inning in the next one. And I've always been a Kyle Gibson apologist. Maybe, maybe his change of scenery is going to come through for him this year too, coming off a nine strikeout effort last time. Uh, because of the bipolar matchups there, I have him in the points league only range of two start pitchers you know if he if if that colorado start ends up being a a skunk then you know you can withstand that a little more in a points league than ones where you're looking to protect dra and whip 
So that's where I put him. Daniel Ponce de Leon is in that same category too. Uh, you know what? With that Flaherty note, it yeah, may I think make I think it, Ponce de Leon's going to start Friday now. Yeah, it may make it so Ponce de Leon's not a two-star pitcher. So scratch that. I'm also not sure about uh, Kim, whose first name I need to commit to memory at one one of these days. Quang Hyun Kim. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, who was the Cardinals closer now moving to the starting rotation. I don't know how stretched out he'll be, but Pirates, White Sox, if he is in line for two starts, makes him pretty interesting. But yeah, that I'm not sure exactly how the Cardinals rotation is going to play out because I was anticipating Flaherty starting Friday when I put together this list. So yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to check back on that on Sunday. Scott, I have a few more names here that I'm just going to throw your way with the matchups and you tell me what you think, whether or not you're going to start these guys or not. Josh Lindblom, who on Thursday, five innings, two runs, seven strikeouts against the White Sox with 12 swinging strikes. He is supposed to be going up against the Twins and at the Cubs. Two so not, not great matchups. Not great matchups. I have him in the no thanks category. Uh, kind of an interesting start today. Obviously, White Sox have have uh, have been at times an easy matchup. I, I think it's just a high variance matchup. The White Sox, a lot of strikeouts, but a lot of thunder in that lineup too. And Lindblom's an interesting pitcher. The time he spent in Korea put up good numbers. Obviously, good control has six pitches that he actually uses. So I, I could see Lindblom becoming relevant at some point, but I'm not ready to buy into him yet, especially with those matchups. Sean Newcomb at Philly and at Miami. You like the Miami start at Philly? Eh. And Newcomb's yeah, he's in, not really He's in the good. no thanks category for me too. I would assume not. the rest of like Rick Porcello, Alex Cobb, Martin Perez, Trevor Williams, Eliezer Hernandez are probably all in that same range, right? Is there anyone there that you like? Cobb, Cobb is kind of interesting. He's pitched well so far. I mean, the mm-hmm. matchups are not great at Philly versus Washington. Right. Yeah, With if he had great matchups, and I could say the same for Lindblom. If, if either of them had great matchups this week, I could get behind them as like a head-to-head points sleeper. But the matchups aren't good enough to, to take that leap on them. And uh, by the way, another one, Robbie Ray. Widely, oh. Oh, no, widely owned, of course, but... <laughs> At Colorado versus San Diego, and he's I, I can't been do it. abysmal so far. Like, like that's the opposite end of the spectrum from Lance McCullers, right? Like, yeah, I can't no do way. it. I can't. No like, way. if if McCullers had those same matchups, like, there's no way I would start him there either. Yeah. But but if Robbie Ray had McCullers' matchups, I probably would start him, even with how terrible he's looked. There's no chance. I with one of those starts being in Colorado and San Diego swinging a hot bat to start the season too. So uh, Robbie Ray. He's just one of those, look, you can't get mad at yourself if he performs well in two starts. If he does, I think you just feel good that you still have him on your team and, and you didn't drop him. Some single starts that I think are pretty solid matchups here. Um, and I know Adam has warned me before, like, Scott does not believe in single start matchup plays. But let's find out if Scott does or not. Christian Javier against the Mariners. I, I imagine you like that one, Scott. Would you start him over Zach Gallon in, in Colorado? I would not. That one's fine. He's not going to qualify for my uh, top 10 sleeper pitchers for week four because he's rostered in more than 70% of leagues. So he misses the threshold there, but yeah, I, I'd be, I, I like the matchup just in a more nebulous sense there for Christian Javier. Javier, I would say is head and shoulders above the other names I'm about to mention. So Scott rank okay. these three Framber Valdez versus the Mariners, Brandon Bialik versus the Giants and Anthony DeSclafani versus the Pirates. How would you rank Des- those three? DeSclafani, Valdez, Bialik. Okay. And would you run any of them out there in a 12-teamer or these more deeper league plays? They're, like, they're desperation in a 12-team league. Like, I, I'm not going out of my way to add them. If... I have only four pitchers available to start next week though, then that might, they might be the best you can do. You know, that's, that's kind of the way I'm, I'm playing this list. And actually um, a name worth mentioning in the same vein, he's, he's rostered in only 47% of leagues, even though he's a bigger name than those pitchers is, is Dylan Cease who's going against the Tigers. So that would probably be the best of the one start sleepers. Uh, 
or actually I, I have Griffin Canning even above him. Griffin Canning's going against Oakland, but like, I just think people are not giving Griffin Canning the appreciation he deserves. So he's only rostered in 63% of leagues. Somebody else that I'd look at. Yeah. And Oakland is kind of off to a slow start offensively as well. So uh, yeah, I think those are some, some good names. I would probably put them in that same Christian Javier range. And then Valdez, Descofani and Bialik are yeah. firmly behind ha- those. Other Javier names. over all of them for me. Yes, I would agree with that. Quickly remind you that you should be watching CBS Sports HQ. It is free, 24-7 sports coverage. I watch it through my Xbox. You can watch it on your phone. You can watch it on your laptop, wherever you want, and it's free. So why wouldn't you do it? You get some wagering tips. Fantasy Football Today is on there. I make some random appearances. Scott probably is going to make some random appearances. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm just going to throw it out there just in case. (laughs) (laughs) And please drop a five-star Apple podcast review uh, with a question and we'll answer it on a future podcast. All right, we're going to take a quick break here. When we get back, Ryan Presley stinks. Who is the next man up in the Astros bullpen? And then we have other names that we need to uh, hit on from Thursday's action. Got some sleeper hitters as well for week four. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here. Fantasy baseball today. We're back here, and Ryan Presley, not great, Bob. First appearance as the closer for the Houston Astros does not record a single out. In fact, I tweeted that he was coming in for the one out uh, for the one run save, and I went to the bathroom. By the time I came back, the game was already over because he blew it, and the game, like, he lost the game against the Arizona Diamondbacks. He allowed a walk, a single, single, single game blouses. That's a Chappelle Show reference. Scott, you're a Chappelle Show guy. Um, I have, you know, I, I, it, I don't know. I wasn't like a devoted <laughs> watcher of it. I was in college when it was on though. So it was totally, I was totally in the target audience. You couldn't, as a college student, when Chappelle show was going on, you right. could not avoid Chappelle show. Um, so I have some familiarity with it. Uh, as a junior high schooler at the time who was <laughs> not the target audience, yeah. I don't know that I should have been watching Chappelle <laughs> show, but I did anyway, and I love yeah. it. Uh, but back to Ryan Presley. Uh, he was not good in this one, Scott. So I'll ask you. I don't know that you have an answer. I don't know that I have an answer. Who is the next man up, if anybody, for the Houston Astros? The next man up, I think, would have to be Blake Taylor. Like, if I was managing the Astros, I would say it was Blake Taylor. He's, he's, he's worked a lot this year, eight and two-thirds innings, 10 strikeouts. You probably haven't heard of him. You haven't heard of anybody in the Astros bullpen. That's kind of the problem here. Like we can't, we can't really lean on track record or or previous experience for pinpointing any of these guys, which is why I think it's very likely Ryan Presley just gets another chance as bad as he was today. I don't know. The velocity was fine. I don't know. He's, he's, he's had some, he's had his own health problems here recently. So I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with him. But there isn't a clear alternative here. I think the only non-rookie in their bullpen right now is Josh James, who is just demoted from the rotation for walking everybody. So obviously he's not going to close. I would guess Blake Taylor is the guy, but I, I, it'd be a pretty deep league where I'm stashing him. And Blake Taylor is a lefty, so that's something that I will also point out. Doesn't have great minor league numbers, but last year... In the minors, he was good. A two one six ERA with a one one zero WHIP. Uh, the name that I was looking at, and I'm probably going to put a few bids in tonight in some deeper roto leagues, is Andre Scrub, who pitched four outs before Ryan Presley came in. So he pitched an inning in a third, uh, came in in the seventh, and also pitched the eighth inning. He's got a cutter curveball combo. He was a reliever in the minors. He converted ten saves there. 221 strikeouts and 192 innings pitched in the minors, but also someone who struggles mightily with walks. So uh, you can... <laughs> He's already gotten a save this season. So Yeah. Scrub, yeah. Uh, I, insert joke here, whatever you want to... like. I, do, I don't want no scrubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, shh, you want to take a shot? Scrub, Blake Taylor. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be Josh James for anyone out there who is speculating on that. Scott, I, I do want to touch on a few more pitching performances from Thursday. Nate Pearson against your Braves. Uh, five innings pitched, two hits, three earned, three walks, five strikeouts. He did allow a two-run homer to Freddie Freeman. Nine swinging strikes on 79 pitches. He didn't really struggle with walks much in the minors. He now has five walks through his first two starts. What was your take? If you're a Nate Pearson owner, I mean, what is your takeaway from the start? Do you feel more optimistic? What's... Where are you settling here on Pearson? I'm 
I'm, I'm probably a little underwhelmed at this point, which isn't totally fair, but he was awfully hyped. He's given up five hits in 10 innings so far. So, you know, that's obviously very good. The strikeouts, the swinging strikes, I wish they were both higher for the amount of hype he's gotten for as good as the stuff looks. I thought it was interesting that second career start and basically nobody was, there wasn't much Twitter chatter for Nate Pearson. You know, Tuki Toussaint was upstaging him in that game. But there's there's no reason to uh, to panic or to consider dropping Pearson. In fact, I'd still be fine starting him. But I'm a little underwhelmed, I guess, just relative to the hype. His next start is against the Marlins next week. The oh, yeah. Juggernaut, as we've mentioned, um, uh, I love like the, that one. I love the matchup. So that's yeah. I think that should be <laughs> that should be a good one for uh, Nate Pearson. Scott, would you consider dropping Jordan Montgomery a clunker on uh, Thursday against the Phillies? Five earned over four innings, and Mike Miner, who went up against the A's, he has not been good. Five earned in five innings pitched in this start, and he got destroyed by the Giants his last time out. So. Montgomery and Miner, are you all right dropping either, any, both? How do you feel about those two? I think they're both droppable if the right opportunity presents itself. I didn't come in with a great deal of confidence in Miner, and after a good first start, two bad starts, velocity's down, and, you know, he had like a mid-fours XFIP last year. So it's not feeling great about him. Uh, I still prefer him to Montgomery, but it's... I, I don't know. It's too early, early, really, to form a judgment on Montgomery, whose first start was was good. Second one, obviously, today not. Uh, it's I'm I'm curious what's going on with his pitch selection because he was very reliant on his curveball as a rookie, and uh, it, it 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 turned out to be a pretty good pitch mix for him. And he's he's throwing a changeup a lot more now. So I'm not sure I'm not sure where that's going to go. I do. Jordan Montgomery almost feels like a blank slate to me, but interesting enough that ideally you'd hold on to him. Not undroppable if you can't. Some hitter notes, some studs. Mention Jose Ramirez, three for four, two homers, a triple, four RBI, and four runs scored for J-Ram. It seems like he is fully back. It's He's performing like a first rounder right now. Not really running so far, but he's got something I've noticed early on the season. A lot of people who we, are, we were expecting to run have has not been running. Like, Trey Turner is not running. Mondesi, I mean, you can't steal first base. He's not running very much. Uh, neither is Jose Ramirez. Is there anything that you've noticed about these guys not running early on? Um, uh, w- there was some concern just, you know, do teams run as much in the postseason? And if, we're, if, if they're going to treat the short season more like the postseason, would it make them hesitant to run? And I don't, like, I don't have, have real data. I don't. I don't know if that's anything more than conjecture in the first place. But there are there are players who've been running a lot. Of course, I, I don't think there's a widespread issue happening there. Uh, I mean, my read on it right now, only two weeks in, is like stolen bases tend to come in bunches for everybody. It's not. It's not a a. This was kind of why I was concerned about drafting. Uh, you know, if, if a guy wasn't a total like mass steals guy, being able to count on him for any amount of stolen bases in such a short season, just because it's a sporadic output over the course of the season, that category, it's not, it's not like a player's stealing a base every five games with consistency, you know? So that's, that's, I I don't know. I, I don't really have any conclusions about that. Trey Turner has zero steals through nine games. He's been caught stealing twice. He's batting 206. He's got a 214 Babbitt. Something I've and noticed. They missed, and they missed a lot of games because of they were scheduled to play the Marlins, right? Yeah. Or maybe the Phillies. I'm not sure which. Maybe both. I don't know. <laughs> um, his fly ball rate is a career high 41% right now. So I think that might be contributing to his low Babbitt. He's got to get back to. Look, there's some guys we want to raise a launch angle. Trey Turner is not one of those. Trey Turner, we want line drives. We want ground balls. We want him to to get on first base and obviously be in a position to steal. So maybe he's kind of felt like he's had to shoulder the load and he's been swinging a little bit more for the fences earlier on. But um, something to pay attention to uh, with his batted ball profile with Trey Turner. Uh, some other hitters. Christian Yelich. You know, I heard, I listened to yesterday's podcast. Some, some dum-dum was like, 
<laughs> worried about Christian Yelich. I don't know who it was, but uh, he had a home run and he had four walks on Thursday. Four walks in a game with two runs scored. So uh, Christian Yelich probably probably shouldn't worry about that guy. Gary Sanchez hit his first homer tonight, and of course, in doing so, he struck out two other times as well. You like to see the home run, though, Scott. I got to ask you, what do we do with these two guys? Because we keep getting a lot of questions. You were the Marcus Simeon guy coming in. 0 for 4, batting 179. Any takeaways with Simeon? Would you consider benching him for next week before he, you know, starts to come around? Because right now he's really just sinking whoever's starting him. Uh, as somebody who has a lot of Marcus Simeon, that's not really an option for me. And he has struck out a lot. That's concerning. It's It's not... It's still such a small sample size that I don't, I don't, I'm not ready to radically change my views on him because things could pick up very quickly. And it's, it's kind of this philosophical debate we've been having in a 60 game season. Do you have to move on from players quicker than you would in a 162 game in, in a 162 game season? And in, in theory, it makes sense. Obviously you, you can't, uh, you can't, uh, accept bad production for as long and still be able to turn your season around. But it's just not, it's just not really the way things work. Like if, if you're confident a player is still good tomorrow could always be the day he turns it around. So if you picked up Dansby Swanson or something and, and you want to a shortstop that you feel pretty confident in otherwise, and you want to swap them out for a week and see how it goes. Like, I, I can't blame you, but I don't think, like, I don't think it makes sense to advise every Marcus Simeon owner to, to bench Marcus Simeon. Now Willie Calhoun went over five on thurs- Thursday and he's batting Oh, 43 to start the season. And for some reason, he's batting right in the middle of the lineup. I, I think that they're using it to like help him gain confidence, but ultimately, it, it is not working. I, I really think that he might have some lingering effects here of getting hit in the face, and he's not playing against left-handed pitching because apparently that's that's something that they're worried about, Scott. Does he need to be owned in any 12-team leagues, even in roto leagues that start five yeah. outfielders? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I would not drop him in a five outfielder league. He was dropped I, in a 15-team in a five outfielder league that I play in, Scott. Somebody dropped him? Yeah. It, that seems premature, right? That's insane. Yeah. yeah no, that's... I mean, there, there has been stuff written about that, uh, about him uh, being a little fearful, maybe, uh, maybe not staying in against inside pitches. It, it could be having an effect, but like he's hardly struck out at all. I, I feel like if, if somebody's approach had changed that drastically, it would show up in the strikeout rate more than anything else. And it's not. So I, I my, my concern level for Willie Calhoun is a little more than most players because, it, you know, I, I could understand how psychologically he, he might be going through something, but it's, it's not a firm, like I, I don't have enough conviction in that idea considering I think the player here is awesome, must-start player if everything comes together, that, that I'm going to move on from. I'm not going to do that. Cesar Hernandez in that same game as Jose Ramirez leading off two for four with a double, a walk, three RBI, and three runs scored. He is batting over 300. Surprisingly enough, I know a lot of people don't like Cesar Hernandez, and he's like not a sexy name, but he's only 49% rostered, and... Considering we're dealing with some injuries right now, uh, Ozzy Albies went down recently. I feel like this number should be higher. Look, especially in Roto Leagues, you're starting a middle infielder there. You're telling me Cesar Hernandez can't be owned in those. And, and the league that he's actually best in is a points league. So mm-hmm. C- Cesar Hernandez is someone who I think should be rostered in more than 49% of leagues, Scott. Um, yeah. Someone else who should probably be rostered in more than where he is is Renato Nunez, who had a double dong on Thursday night. He now has four home runs. He is only 40% rostered. I assume that he's owned in Roto Leagues where you use a corner infielder. Scott, is he someone that should be owned in a head-to-head points league? I don't, I wouldn't say he should be. The lineups there are so small. Uh, it's it's difficult to fit him in. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are going to be weeks where he's in my top 10 sleeper hitters for the upcoming scoring period and... He'll be plenty useful even in that format. 
uh, but it's just it's it's a it's a difficult difficult threshold to meet. But you know, I gotta say, overall, I'm I'm encouraged by what Nunez is doing. We we didn't really know how last year's stats would translate, and it looks like he's picked up right where he left off. And last year, he was what in terms of home runs and RBI over thirty and over ninety, I think. So you know, the this is no scrub here. Yeah, thirty one and ninety home runs and RBI for Nunez last year. And his swing is just built for Camden because he puts the ball in the air so much. And you guys have talked about how that made Manny Machado a great player. And right now it seems like it's helping Renato Nunez be a great player as well. Scott, if you had like Chris Davis or Brian Reynolds as your utility bat, would you drop either of those players for Renato Nunez? Not Reynolds. Uh, Davis. Mm. I'd rather be starting Nunez than Davis right now, but in the long run, I still have more confidence in Davis. Isaiah Davis may be turning things around. Yeah, he had two, two hits, hits today, two. but again, he only started against a lefty. So, mm, seems yeah. like he's... I mean, the playing time has to... The short if side he's not of the playing every day, you can't start him. Right. Uh, Isaiah kiner Falefa. this one, how is he only 41% roster? I mean, this is just like mind-boggling to me because he should be owned even in leagues where you start one catcher. And I was going to say, like... I am going to move him inside my top 10 catchers. The way that he is playing, the way that he's running, he's stealing bases for the Texas Rangers as well. He went three for four Thursday with a triple and two runs scored. Scott, I am going to move him just ahead of Carson Kelly in my rankings, just behind Christian Vasquez. That'll make him the eighth ranked catcher. I don't think it's crazy. There's tons of volume there. He plays every single day. Yeah, it's more aggressive than I've done. I have him 14th right now, and I was... I was the big kind of Falefa backer back, you know, in the preseason. <laughs> it's I don't true. Know if you remember? It is true. Uh, yeah, playing time, especially in points leagues, which is usually, I mean, I, I guess there are a lot of one catcher leagues, but certainly all points leagues are, and just the volume he gets there, really makes a difference at that position more than any other. Like a guy who plays literally every day can just out accumulate everyone else at the position, and you know, obviously we're not talking about him on the level of like a JT Romuto or Wilson Contreras, but he, he will put up a start worthy point total. If he continues to play every day, there's just no way around it. It's, it's still a question of how good he is. He was showing a lot of power in spring training and summer camp so far, no home runs, only two extra base hits triples. I mean, he only has 10 hits total. So I don't know that that necessarily means anything, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But I, I agree with you that the percentage is too low. Donovan Solano is the last one. <laughs> this is just crazy. I, look, it's 2020. You can't, yeah, nothing will surprise me at this point. But Donovan Solano, three more hits, including two doubles. He's, he's batting 465, Scott. I mean, what do we do with yeah. Donovan Solano? So here's the thing he's, he's obviously not going to hit 465. And so you look at, he had a 485 BAPIP coming into today, but he's obviously not going to hit 465. So they're both going to go down. Um, when he hit 330-ish last year, Solano had a 409 BAPIP, which is obviously crazy high as well, not something you'd expect to sustain. He also had a 33.9 line drive rate, and of course line drives are what elevate BAPIP the most. Uh, so this year he, has, he entered this game with a 32.4 line drive rate, so... 33.9 last year, 32.4 this year. Do you know among qualifiers last year who what the league-leading line drive rate was? I'm going to say that it was like 27% by Whit Merrifield. It was Whit, Mer Whit Merrifield, 28.5. So significantly lower than what Solano put up last year and what he's putting up so far now. Yeah, line drive rate, as Chris Towers likes to point out, it's always based on a small sample of line drives. So... Uh, you know, it, it really takes a few years to get a grasp of what kind of line drive hitter a player is, at least a, a firm grasp of it. But, you know, if I, I guess my point is, if that is true for Solano with the line drives, then he's as well equipped for an outrageous BABIP as any player. And, you know, maybe he will be somebody who competes for a batting title this year. Probably not with a lot of power. He does have six doubles. But you know, not not home run type power. Um, he'll be low. I, I I feel pretty confident saying 
Solana will be like low end useful, like a good injury fill in type. Um, yeah, just not not somebody you're ever going to to shy too far away from, you know, even if he's on and off the waiver wire all year. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of like Luis Arise, like what we were expecting out of Luis Arise. And he's, like, it's not a good lineup, but he's batting in the middle of the Giants lineup. So there are going to be some RBI opportunities there as well. So, all right, Donovan Solano. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, definitely, like, look, if you need a middle infielder, you need batting average help, I, he's someone that... Uh, you can add right now, especially while he's hot and and hitting as many line drives as he is. Some deeper league names that I just wanted to bring up quickly. Anderson Tejada made his big league debut for the Rangers on Thursday. Two for four with a home run, three RBI, and a stolen base. He hadn't played a single game above high A ball entering today's game. I'm not like particularly interested, but AL only, I guess, remember the name. Matt Kemp has started five of the last six games. For the Rockies, he was batting fifth on Thursday. He went one for two with a walk. Uh, Nick Markakis, walk-off homer tonight. 14% rostered. Scott, should that be higher, Nick Markakis? Probably not. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious how the Braves are going to make their out their lineup here in the near future. Adam Duvall, I think, has started against righties on back-to-back days. Matt Adams is out, of course. Uh, they may be shying away from Ender and Ciarte. Which, you know, is, is maybe not the greatest thing in fantasy because I think he has three steals already in Ciarte. But I don't know. There's there's some moving parts there. And uh, none of them are so high end that you should be watching it that closely, I guess. Uh, Max Stassi has started three of the last four games for the Angels and he has homered in back-to-back. So in two-catcher leagues, uh, if you are desperate, Someone to look at. Dylan Moore has started six of the last seven for the Seattle Mariners, is batting 333 with two homers, and picked up his third stolen base of the season on Thursday. He has shortstop and outfield eligibility. He also had a 42 steal season in the minors. So if you do need some speed um, in those five outfielder leagues, deeper leagues, a name to look at. And Nick Heath, speaking of speed, he started for the Royals on Thursday. He went one for four with a walk, stole his second base. Scott, he had 60 steals in the minors last year. Nick Heath, he also strikes out like an absurd amount of the time. But the speed is real for Nick Nick Heath um, if you are really desperate. Really, really desperate. Jared, or Gerard (laughs) Dyson, right? Gerard Gerard Dyson 2.0, right? Yeah, he stole two. Um, Gerard Dyson stole two bases today. So did Monty Harrison. So just a whole bunch of steals across baseball. Good Good for Monty Harrison. Yeah. Yeah. Full disclosure, I had not heard of Nick Heath until right now. <laughs> so thank you for educating me on Nick Heath. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, you know, in any of those deeper leagues, Scott, if you need uh, if you need any speed, uh, I was your guy who helped you out with Nick Heath. Speaking of hitters, Scott, who are some sleepers that you like coming up this upcoming week? Uh, week four, I believe. Might be week three for some people, but the week that starts on August 10th. Some sleeper hitters. Matt Kemp, who you just mentioned, has been starting a lot lately. This is the Rockies' first week that will be spent fully at Coors Field. So Kemp, I think, is a good play. Ryan McMahon, not as sure about Daniel Murphy because he he might be in and out of the lineup more than Kemp at this point. But, you know, good week for Rockies. Um, I haven't put this list in order yet, so bear with me. Uh, Kyle Tucker particularly since he's been playing against lefties and his minor league numbers are good against lefties. I'd feel okay about running him out there. Um, Howie Kendrick, who's rostered in less than 50% of the leagues and is back in the lineup after uh, he missed, I think five games with an injury. The nationals have the second best matchups of any team. So he seems like a, a must for this week. He might be number one on the list. Actually, once I organize it better, Will Myers, I think he's a good play this week. Let me look at their matchups. Their matchups are middle of the road, but you know he's still he's still only sixty four percent rostered. Myers, so he's he's, he's a good play every week, up. Scott. Yeah, I mean maybe certainly certainly in five outfielder leagues he should be, but I guess he's probably rostered in all of those already. Really deep here, uh, I'm fascinated by what Todd Frazier is doing. He hit his second home run today. And uh, 
you know, his, his slash line right now is 289, 372, 553. Been playing every, every day for the Rangers, who they have, they have good matchups this week. He's only 8% rostered, so out there everywhere. He has three multi-hit games in a row. Yeah. And, and he's batting right in the middle of that lineup. Doesn't seem to be selling out for power as much, which is a good thing because his he was just getting crushed with BABIP in recent years. And it really has started to turn around last year. He just dealt with injuries and stuff, so never never had a chance to really stick in fantasy. But I think he's he's somebody you could look into. It's it's not a super exciting group to be honest. We're we're to the point now where um you know, most most of the exciting hitters are rostered in too many leagues for me to call them a sleeper for the upcoming week. So uh, the Diamondbacks have a series in Colorado, so Cole Calhoun might be somebody you look into. Uh, and he's been Christian, batting second, so right at the top of the order for Cole yeah. Calhoun. Christian Walker, certainly, if you're in a shallower league where, you know, he's not somebody you could pick up very much, but he might be a good play this week. A couple teams have eight games, actually. Just... Uh, some schedule changes were announced just earlier today, uh, earlier Thursday, uh, to fix the Cardinals, the games they missed. So Tigers and Cardinals are both playing eight games this week. Uh, I don't know who you consider there. Maybe Jacoby Jones. He hasn't done as much recently, I don't think. Jonathan Scope, if you were desperate for a second baseman or middle infielder. He hasn't been yeah. terrible. Yeah. Maybe Colton Wong. Colton Wong's done nothing so far, but I think that'll change eventually. Cardinals have missed a lot of time, so I give, I'm giving him a pass for now. Tyler O'Neill in five outfielder leagues, too. Off mm-hmm. to a solid yeah. start. That's true. I'm going to add him to this list. All righty, Scott. Uh, that'll, that'll do it, man. Any big plans for the weekend? Watch some Chappelle show? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. No big plans for me. I am a boring... Mid thirties, dad. What about you? You're you're young. You're swinging. Oh my god! I'm gonna be you know I'm gonna be crushing around, man. I I've I've got this bum ankle right now. I messed up my ankle playing basketball, <laughs> so I'm on I'm on crutches right now. So yeah. not really a whole lot for me going on. I'm probably just gonna sit home and watch a bunch of Dragon Ball Z. That's cool. <laughs> that's my weekend. <laughs> I'm glad we had this conversation. We are superstars. We are superstars. That's right. He is Scott. <laughs> I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching. Fantasy baseball today on our YouTube channel. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. We'll be back again on Monday. Bye bye.